everybody and welcome back to the Mythgard Academy. <clears throat> this is session number five on A Wizard of Earthsea by Ursula Le Guin. Uh, it should be, if all goes according to plan, our penultimate session on A Wizard of Earthsea. Um, as you know, I got a little behind there at the beginning, but we're catching up and uh, uh, we should, uh, I think, I think we'll still be fine for six. Uh, we'll see how we do. But um, in the interest of that, let's move along, though. Um, just a couple quick announcements uh, at the beginning. First, I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that we're having a our holiday sale um, for gift certificates. If you would like to give a friend or acquaintance the gift of uh, access to one of our Signum courses, if you know somebody who you think would enjoy uh, anything out of our Signum course catalog, almost anything out of our Signum course catalog, um, the only things that are not available from the catalog are things that didn't have lectures, like uh, our translation seminar, which consisted only of people getting together and working together on their translations, so there's really nothing to kind of do asynchronously there. Apart from things like that, um, all of our courses are available. So uh, if you've thought of that, of, uh, you know, a, one of your friends or relations who might be interested in, uh, a, you know, a, a different kind of uh, president, uh, present this holiday season. Uh, I hope that uh, you will consider that we're having a, a special seventy-five dollars for any uh, of the courses. Well, basically, you get a gift certificate, which is a voucher worth any of them they can choose on their own. Uh, so it's pretty cool. Anyhow, so that's one thing uh, that's happening. Another thing is tomorrow. Thursday, December 12th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time in the afternoon, uh, we're going to be having a special symposium hosted by Brenton Dickinson, one of our faculty members and uh, uh, the host of the Pilgrim in Narnia um, uh, blog. Uh, and he is going to be uh, hosting this session, which is called What is Signum Culture? It's going to be perspectives from some of our students and staff and faculty talking about what makes uh, Signum University as an institution special? And I was really, this was uh, not my idea. Uh, I thought it was a really cool kind of thing. Cause I think that a lot of people, you know, many people uh, have, uh, you know, participated in uh, my, broad my broadcasts, my MythGuard uh, broadcasts. Uh, a bunch of people, of course, have taken our courses and uh, really enjoyed that. Um, but a lot of people I think don't really, uh, know a lot of the stuff that kind of goes on backstage, a lot of the ways in which we're really trying to change higher education in more than just, you know, the let's do awesome online, let's do online education better and cheaper uh, kind of approach. Um, there's a lot uh, to what Signum does in addition to that. So anyway, uh, I think that'll be really fun. Yes, it will be recorded. That'll be on the YouTube channel. Uh, and Noam, yes, it is in a reasonable hour uh, uh, for those of you on the other side of the Atlantic from us. So uh, so that'll be good. Anyway, I, just, I encourage you to join us. Go to signumuniversity.org slash events, and you'll see there's a there's an event page for it with the, with the sign up uh, there. And finally, I would just, uh, if you haven't yet uh, subscribed uh, to Kay Ben Abraham's new uh, serial podcast release novel, *The Flower of the Cedar*, I recommend it very strongly. Uh, this is a this is a wonderful book uh, and read by an excellent reader. I think that uh, uh, her idea, Kay's idea, to release this as a serial audiobook is a, is just a wonderful uh, a wonderful thing. Um, and it's a great book, and I really uh, I really commend it all to you. So. Uh, uh, look for any on on any uh, uh, podcast uh, service and and uh, look for the flower of the cedar by K Ben Abraham and uh, check it out. It's uh, it's really good. So, all right, um, those are the things that are happening immediately now. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, no, don't worry, Kimber. I was uh, about to uh, share the slides. Let's see. There you go. There you go. All right. The slides are there. Um, okay. So, you ready? Ready to jump into the text? Off into chapter seven. We're going to try to do uh, uh, discuss chapter seven and chapter eight today, um, which means we're going to be looking at the three different confrontations uh, that Sparrowhawk has with his shadow, right? So we, we talked about the, uh, the dragon of Pendor last time uh, and uh, and then of course his uh, uh, his initial flight um, we just got to the last 
of the uh, of the you know to that to the to that first confrontation right when he was uh, sort of lured out into the countryside right um, um, we're going to be looking at the next ones uh, after that and of course where he ends up first so uh, he was blacking out at the end of chapter six and looking like he was about to get caught by his shadow there was that sense of a voice calling to him right and him running towards some voice but he didn't know what it was and everything um where he ends up at the beginning uh of this chapter i think is really interesting a coverlet of downfilled satin slid aside as ged sat up and he saw himself clothed in a tunic of silk and cloth of silver like a lord on a chair beside the bed, boots of glove leather and a cloak lined with palawi fur were laid ready for him. He sat a while, calm and dull as one under an enchantment, and then stood up, reaching for his staff. But he had no staff. His right hand, though it had been salved and bound, was burned on palm and fingers. Now he felt the pain of it and the soreness of all his body. He stood without moving a while again. Then he whispered, not aloud and not hopefully, Hoig, hoig, for the little fierce loyal creature too was gone, the little silent soul that once had led him back from death's dominion. Had it still been with him last night when he ran? Was that last night? Was it many nights ago? He did not know. All was dim and obscure in his mind, the gebeth, the burning staff, the running, the whispering, the gate. None of it came back clearly to him. Nothing even now was clear. He whispered his pet's name once more, but without hope of answer, and tears rose in his eyes. Um, yeah, Nancy, this is really, really sad. Um, the Otak, which has been his faithful uh, pet, um, has had lots of highlights, right? Of course, one of the primary ones, which I don't even think we talked about that passage, but um, when he was led back from death's dominion, uh, the licking of his hands by the Otak, which established enough of that connection with life that it brought him back, um, uh, was certainly, a, you know, the way that the Otak found him and stuck to him, right? Um, the way that it went with Vetch when he was injured, when when uh, uh, when Sparrowhawk was injured, right, by the shadow originally, and then, you know, came back. It was part of his, you know, so this is the second time now he's been, he's, he's had his second face-to-face -face, uh, meeting with the shadow. He has been injured both times and has, you know, woken up in a, in a, in a recuperative bed both times, and both times without the Otak. Right, the Otak uh, uh, was taken by Vetch the first time, and now, of course, the Otak is just gone. Um, and uh, yes, David, I absolutely agree. The Otak was certainly more than uh, just a pet, almost a familiar. It was hard. I mean, it was paralleled, of course, to the Raven uh, of Nemerly the Archmage um, uh, before, uh, right, earlier on when he was back in Roke. It was never made entirely clear exactly what that meant, right? Um, the concept of, you know, a wizard's familiar and how the relationship exactly between wizard and familiar uh, within the Earthsea context here differs from the relationship of person and pet, right? Has never been really spelled out, or at least I've not observed it very clearly. Um, uh, going through, but I do think that, uh, it, it, but David, it's certainly uh, a good observation and a good thing to remember that there does seem to be this conception, right, of a special bond between a wizard and some animal. And it's certainly in the case of the Otak, it was almost like the Otak came and chose him. He did name it, right? You know, he said its true name, and that did seem to bind it to him. But it, he didn't just pull it out of the wild, right? It approached him, which we were told at the time was very unusual for an Otak. Otaks are not sociable beasts. It was strange for the Otak. The Otak was a lowly creature. Remember, Jasper teased him um, for making a familiar of a rat, um, even though 
It's not a rat, technically. It's an otak. Um, but still. Uh, so, you know, it was, uh, it, it was as I say, a, a lowly creature. It was an unusual creature, though. Nobody, nobody tames an otak, right? Nobody has an otak for a pet. Um, so it was, it was another one of those interesting, though relatively subtle, marks that get is different, Right. You know, just as his success with the goat charming spell the first time he said it, not knowing what he was doing, was also a mark that there was an unusual power about him uh, as his aunt, the witch, perceived as soon as she heard about it. Um, So anyway, you know, it has meant several things. Of course, the the moment that I find most striking in the, I feel like I'm giving the eulogy of the Otak, right? Let us look back over, uh, over the significant moments in the career of the Otak. Um, but, um, uh, but anyway, yes, good. As uh, Nancy is recalling the passage saying that, uh, um, what Ged said to it was, do you want to come with me? Yes, exactly. It did really seem to choose him. And we didn't really know why. Right. Again, there was there was something just sort of special about that. Um, The moment that really strikes out to me most, the most uh, powerful moment, in my opinion, anyway, in my experience uh, of the Otak is its scream. Right. Otaks don't make any sound. Uh, They they don't vocalize like they can't vocalize. Uh, But when the shadow comes out. Uh, when the shadow is summoned, right? At the summoning of the dead, when the shadow emerges and attacks Ged, the Otak screams. Um, and the scream of the silent Otak, the way in which Ged's own terror and horror and, I don't know what, revulsion at what has happened, at what he has done, at what he has brought the, as the, the consequences of his terrible decision and horrible action come upon him and start chewing on his face... Um, the Otak is the one that expresses his, what, his feelings, his perspective. Um, yeah, good. David was just saying the same thing, that that's, that that moment it's, of, of its scream uh, was the one that really stood out for me. And now it's gone. Um, you know, we don't yet know what happened to it. Remember, the last reference that we got to it was right before Skior turned on him. Right, and he d- discovered that Skior was a Gebeth. Um, he had the the Otak was in his sleeve. I think it was taking shelter inside his clothing in the place where it always took shelter when it's cold outside. Right, so we know it was not only with him, but sort of intimately with him. Right inside his clothes, and yet now he can't find it. It's gone. Right, and. We have no idea what happened to it, um, but the loss, especially in the context, Ged wakes up and finds everything completely changed, right? He is in this rich apartment. He's dressed like a lord. He doesn't recognize himself, but he also is very confused, right? He has no staff. That's the other thing, of course, that he's missing. There are two things that he's missing. His staff and his otak. Um, his friend and companion from the Isle of, from the, uh, the island of Roke and his staff, which was given to him on the island of Roke. So both of those seem very significant losses. Ged has been stripped in a way. He's not only lost all of his clothes, right? But he's been stripped in a far more profound way, it would seem. That Otak, which was, as the narrator reminds us, a link to life for him, is gone. The staff, which was the symbol of his power uh, and his, his, his training um, at Roke, is also gone. <laughs> yes, yes, he does have a staffing problem, uh, Stephen, absolutely. Um, notice, though, that this is not only just a momentary... It's, it's not just him being bleary because he's waking up, right? Um, he sat for a while, calm and dull as one under an enchantment. So, th- I mean, but that by itself, I mean, I feel like that on pretty much a daily basis. I mean, ask my kids. That's just how I wake up every day. So, um, uh, it doesn't seem like it is uh, obviously 
strange until it goes on, right? Um, a little bell rang somewhere far away. A second bell rang in a sweet jangle just outside the room. A door opened behind him across the room, and a woman came in. "'Welcome, Sparrowhawk,' she said, smiling. She was young and tall, dressed in white and silver, with a net of silver crowning her hair that fell straight down like a fall of black water. Stiffly, Ged bowed. "'You don't remember me, I think.' "'Remember you, lady?' He had never seen a beautiful woman dressed to match her beauty but once in his life, that lady of O, who had come with her lord to the Sun Return Festival at Roke. She had been like a slight, bright candle flame, but this woman was like the white new moon. "'I thought you would not,' she said, smiling. "'But forgetful as you may be, you're welcome here as an old friend.' "'What place is this?' Ged asked, still stiff and slow-tongued. He found it hard to speak to her, and hard to look away from her. The princely clothes he wore were strange to him. The stones he stood on were unfamiliar. The very air he breathed was alien. He was not himself, not the self he had been. And uh, that is uh, on the Le Guin scale, a... Uh, a smack on the forehead with a club, right? Uh, that is as much of as, uh, as a club to the forehead as Le Guin is going to give. She is uh, uh, very subtle. Um, but here we are being told clearly he, he is not himself, right? We already got hints of that. The loss of the Otak, the missing staff, right? The new clothes. But this is not just someone who finds himself in a strange place. Um, he is, it's like he's in a completely new world. It's like he's a completely different person. And his interaction with this woman uh, strongly underscores that, right? Uh, to me, the most bewildering moment in this whole scene, or rather the moment that makes this seem more than just, I blacked out and I don't remember where I am, right? Or I'm still bleary with sleep and I'm having a hard time following what's happening, right? Um, the thing that really kind of transforms this into a moment which begins to feel like enchantment for real, not just in metaphor, right? But for real, um, is the woman, right? The fact that he, in the middle, in the midst of his confusion, not knowing where he is, not knowing wh how he's dressed the way that he is, uh, not feeling at all like himself, being without his staff and missing his Otak, she comes in and just welcomes him by name and remarks on the fact that he doesn't remember her, right? Um, it's very disorienting, right? I mean, it, it it almost invites us, it seems to me, to ask, like, did, uh, did something happen? Right. I mean, like, did, uh, has he been here this whole time? Was like the whole previous thing, a dream or something like that. Right. Like everything around him suggests that a, he's in a completely alien place. Everything is different. Nothing is, is familiar. Nothing at all is familiar around him. Um, uh, down to the last detail. There's, I mean, there's nothing that he recognizes, and yet he himself is recognized. This strange woman is speaking to him as if he was an old friend, right? Um, you're welcome here as an old friend, she says. It's like, again, like, did he, has he had amnesia and is waking up, right? It's, 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 again, it's moved from, you know, I got knocked out and I don't remember anything after that. And I don't know how I got from there to here to have like years gone by that I didn't know about or something. Um, it's, um, it's very strange. And Nancy, absolutely. Uh, Nancy, uh, points out the thing, which I think makes this so significant. He was just confronted by a Gebeth, right? The end of chapter six saw Ged confronting something which bore the outer semblance of a man, but which was shadow within. And his terror, his fear upon confronting the Gebeth was that the shadow was going to devour him as well. Um, he was named by the creature, by the shadow creature, right? The shadow named him and thereby mastered him. And his power was 
cut off, right? He could do nothing but beat it with his stick, which is all that his wizard staff had become, and then run away as fast as he could, right? And so Nance, and we don't know, we didn't know at the end of chapter six what happened. So we do have a question, therefore. I think we should be have, like, did it get him? Is this the consequence? Is this, is he on the road to Gebethedom? Uh, you know, is this alien appearance? The You know, we saw before a man who looked like a man on the outside, but was alien underneath, right? Inhuman underneath. Is something like that happening with Gebethedom? I mean, it's a really good question. Who is he, right? Um, when you've just confronted this shadow creature who wants to eat you uh, and walk around in your body, waking up feeling like you're on an alien planet and in like coming in into the midst of somebody else's experience and somebody else's memories. That's got to be freaky, right? Um, that has got to be freaky. And I think it's certainly something that bears thinking about for us, right? That leads the readers also to a certain amount of bewilderment. Um, how exactly can we understand this? Um, Melanie, I agree. Ged being slow tongued so that it is hard to speak is especially dangerous for a wizard whose magic depends on words and names. Absolutely. He's not just as, uh, you know, you'll remember, of course, Melanie, how we were reminded about the importance of a wizard's telling the truth, right? Or that wizards don't lie because their speech is so important and they're naming, you know, they're, they're naming the true names of things that, that, that the wizard's speech should be truly connected to the things that it describes is intrinsic to wizardliness. Right. Uh, and so there again, like, uh, Melanie, as you're suggesting this important, really crucial connection, uh, between, uh, between wizards and their speech. So you're absolutely right. This is not just like, I'm kind of sleepy. It's ominous, right? Um, it is definitely ominous. Um, he found it hard to speak to her and hard to look away from her. Both of those things are a little bit concerning in their own ways. I mean, she's cute and she's female and he's what, 18? <laughs> I get it. But, but there's, again, but is that it? Right. Under all the circumstances, uh, you know, the prospect of enchantment has already been raised. Right. Uh, a couple paragraphs before on the previous slide. Um, good. Mark is also remembering that the Gebeth also was slow and slurred of speech. Right. Uh, remember when uh, when the Gebeth spoke and it had a voice that was not like uh, not like a human's. Right. Um, but thick and slurred like it like like it had no lips. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Ged sounding like a Gebeth has got to be a bad thing. You've got to think. Right. So um, he doesn't understand what's going on. We don't know what's going uh, uh, what's what's going on. N and David, I absolutely agree. His perception of this woman seems very much like a fairy princess. Yeah, this is not just like and she was kind of hot. Right. There's there's the, the, the description is it's she is otherworldly. Right. Uh, notice that's one of the distinctions, you know, that this is, you know, when he says that the Lady of O before um, was like a slight bright candle flame and this woman is like a white new moon, that's obviously means much more than the other one was wearing a red dress, but this one is wearing a white dress, right? It's much more than that. Um, he is there. They were both bright. Right. They were both striking like a candle in a dark room. Um, uh, but. A candle flame. Is a common household thing, right? The white new moon is also a familiar thing, but it's not uh, it's not a worldly thing. It's not something you expect to walk through the door of the room uh, that you were sleeping in. Um, yeah. Yeah. And Devora, I do agree that the rich, uh, the rich clothing and surroundings are also uh, a kind of red flag. Uh, I agree that there has not been a strong correlation between, you know, wealth, wealth and position and, you know, virtue and uh, desirable things uh, so far. You're right that uh, the best people uh, that we have, you know, that we trust most have been humble people so far. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. So this is the frame that we get for this next stage of Ged's experience right here in the court of the Terranon, which is where he is told that he is, which remembers what he was seeking. And he was seeking it because he got that miscellaneous tip from that random wizardly dude that he ran into before. Right. Um, If this was strange, it was only part of the strangeness of this place and of his presence in it. Ged's mind never seemed quite to be clear. It never seemed quite to clear. He could not see things plainly. He had come to this tower, this tower keep by chance, and yet the chance was all design. Or he had come by design, and yet all the design had merely chance to come about. He had set out northward. A stranger in Oromi had told him to seek help here. An, Os- an Oskilian ship had been waiting for him. Skior had guided him. How much of this was the work of the shadow that hunted him? Or was none of it? Had he and his hunter both been drawn here by some other power? He following that lure and the shadow following him, and seizing on Skior for its weapon when the moment came? That must be it. For certainly the shadow was, as Seret had said, that's the, the woman of course, barred from the court of the Terranon. He had felt no sign or threat of its lurking presence since he wakened in the tower. But what then had brought him here? For this was no place one came to by chance. Even in the dullness of his thoughts he began to see that. No other stranger came to these gates. The tower stood aloof and remote, its back turned on the way to Neshem that was the nearest town. No man came to the keep. None left it. Its windows looked down on desolation. Oh, man. I, I, I just, I love, it's like almost every paragraph of Ursula Le Guin is guaranteed to give you at least one sentence that you just want to read and reread and reread, right? And that one is the one for me. Oh, man. Its windows look down on desolation. What a great sentence that is. Um, yeah, Noam, I agree. It sounds more and more like a fairy court. Yeah, the more that we see, it is like he has crossed over into fairy. Um, it is uh, His waking here in the court of the Terranon, it's a very otherworldly experience uh, in that way. Um, good. Ah, see, David is reminding us. I've uh, We skipped over the chapter title, which was The Hawk's Flight, right? Uh, and of course, that's going to end up being purely descriptive, as this is the chapter that we'll see Sparrowhawk fleeing in the form of a hawk, right? A peregrine falcon um, across the sea, right? And ending up back in Gaunt. Um, so it's a purely descriptive one. But of course, as David is reminding us, we should remember the opening poem, Bright the Hawk's Flight on the Empty Sky, right? Uh, even though it's, as David says, not 100% clear what the connection is. Uh, it seems non-coincidental. And I agree. See, David, here I had all these aspirations to get through chapter 7 and 8 today, and now we're going back to the poem at the beginning. Oh, man, that might not happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, David, how this... Uh, David is asking... David Erbach is asking, how is this castle being provisioned? How little connection to the outside does it have? It's distinctly creepy. Yeah, it's distinctly creepy. Remember, isn't, isn't it described like um, his room, Ged's room, is in the top of a tower that sticks up like a tooth coming out of the hill? Right? <laughs> That's not a good look. Right? That's really not a good look. Um, uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Um... It seems to have very little connection to the outside. How is it being provisioned? No idea. What does anybody here eat and drink? It's a good question, though, you know, David, I think to the, you know, the discussion we've been having, like Noam was just reminding us about a fairy court, right? Food and drink is always an issue in fairy courts, right? When mortals wander into the fairy realms. And it does. I mean, I think uh, the the absoluteness of the of the of the solitude of the place as you know we're being led to understand it here does seem to invoke that kind of mystery right um it's it's we we have no idea we have no idea uh how it's being provisioned is anyone eating or drinking anything 
Um, <laughs> yes, it is. It is there's a, there is a non-zero chance, it seems, that Bella Lugosi lives in this castle, Arthur. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, his first thought, of course, is a fear. So his first perception, which even his continual muddled head, um, of which, again, you'll notice this doesn't wear off, right? He's here for days and days, uh, and his, his mind never seemed quite to clear, right? Um, but even to his foggy mind, he is sure that he's not, it's, it's not an accident, right? Uh, some doom has brought him here, um, but by whom was the doom deemed is, is uh, exactly the question uh, that he's trying to... Uh, uh, that he's trying to figure out, right? His first impulse is that he was corralled here by the shadow. Um, and that's not surprising, right? Uh, it's not surprising anyway that that is his first thought, I mean, because, of course, the shadow and his flight from the shadow has been his primary focus. Um, and so, okay, something creepy and horrible seems to be possibly happening to me. It's probably the fault of the shadow who's hunting me. But he realizes that that is probably not the case, right? The shadow is definitely not here. It does seem to be true, as uh, Sarette, the woman, has told him, uh, that there, the shadow is walled out, right? The, the keep does keep the shadow away, it seems. Um, so he then theorizes that some other power drew both of them here. Right? He has been lured here by some other power and that the shadow was only following him. Right? Um, so the shadow's pursuit of him almost to the gate is in that sense, he suspects, an accident. Right? A chance. So there seems to be chance and there seems to be design. He's not following, he doesn't think he's following a script, but this can't all be coincidence. Right? Something is orchestrating things here. Um, and, uh, oh, yes, Karita, I do agree. The, uh, uh, it's back turned on the way to Neshem. It, what a wonderful description of the tower, right? Um, I mean, you could just say, like, the tower faced over the cliffside. I'm sure it's a better view, right? Naturally, you would put most of the windows on the outward facing side of your tower, but, uh, but that, that metaphor of the tower standing with its back turned uh, on the way uh, to the way to the nearest town uh, is, is really a lovely one. Then Serret, mischievously, right, as if in defiance of her husband um, and at risk to herself, brings him to see the Terranon, the precious jewel, the precious stone, which is uh, the, tre the greatest treasure of her husband, the greatest treasure of the tower. Do you see it? Saren asks. Because remember, it's, it's a cold, uh, unusually cold, um, uh, like it's kind of surprising they don't store perishable goods there cold, um, but it's an empty blank room, just a stone room with stone floors and stone walls and nothing in it except cold and a creepy sensation, right? Do you see it? Serret asked. As Ged looked round the room, his wizard's eye caught one stone of those that made the floor. It was rough and dank as the rest, a heavy, unshapen paving stone. Yet he felt the power of it, as if it spoke to him aloud, and, its bre and his breath caught in his throat, and a sickness came over him for a moment. This was the founding stone of the tower. This was the central place, and it was cold, bitter cold. Nothing could ever warm the little room. This was a very ancient thing. An old and terrible spirit was prisoned in that block of stone. He did not answer Serret yes or no, but stood still, and presently, with a quick, curious glance at him, she pointed out the stone. That is the Terranon. Do you wonder that we keep so precious a jewel locked away in our deepest hoard room? Still, Ged did not answer, but stood dumb and wary. She might almost have been testing him, but he thought she had no notion of the stone's nature, to speak of it so lightly. She did not know enough of it to fear it. Tell me of its powers, he said at last. Um, so 
so, Nancy, I think it's it's not that the sickness is caused by the stone direct. It is, but if I'm understanding you correctly, I don't think it is that like you know the stone is sending him like afflicting him with sickness or something like that. Um, it is a reaction. I think it's it's a reaction to his proximity to this uh, evil and repulsive thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes. Um, <laughs> Stephen says a woman acting in apparent defiance to her lordly husband. Uh, that always and this always ends well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, Stephen, you know, one of the things that uh, that I couldn't help but think of here um, was Lady Bersalak, or Lady Bertalak, depending on your uh, editor, um, from Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, uh, right? The, uh, the, the, the lady of the tower there. Um, uh, very much what this reminded me of, though much creepier and much less amusing. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Um, so, Noam asks, is that a power? Yes, yes, definitely. This, you know, with the arts and powers that we were t- have been talking about from the first day, or crafts and powers, uh, this, is, this is one of the powers. Right. Um, this is exactly the kind of thing that I was suspecting was meant by a capital P power from the beginning. Like there's some beings that are sources of powers that can be found in the world. Um, so there is the the wizard craft that people learn. And there is some power that is within people like inborn power that 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 you have, like like get always had from when he was a kid. But there's power, lowercase p and powers, capital P. Right. And this is clearly one of those capital P, um, capital P powers. Um, it seems like she's testing him. Right. Um, notice he does not want to believe. I mean, he doesn't believe at first. And I think doesn't want to believe that she can possibly know. Right. Um, she did not know enough of it to fear it. He's thinking like, okay, so I have, you know, my highly tuned wizardly sensibilities and I can sense this thing and I am revolted just being in the same room with it. Right. I know that it is not only precious and powerful, um, but that it is repulsive, evil and insidious and super, super dangerous. But, you know, she is just like an innocent lamb here. Right. Not understanding. Um Yes, Devorah, it is something within the stone. Um, but N- Nancy, you're right. There is a kind of naivete that he's showing here, right? She says she's always been, he's already been fooled by a lot of people. And he's definitely seen some corruption, but he just can't conceive of her understanding the stone and not worrying about what it does. Um, yes, and, you know, Nancy, I would add, notice all the stuff we've already been seeing, right? I mean, like, it's been obvious to us from page one of this chapter that something was going on, right? There is something influencing him. Um, as uh, Melanie, as you were pointing out, just his slowness of speech, the how hard he finds it to get words out and how unclear his mind has been. Those are bad, bad signs, right? If there is something impeding his, uh, you know, the mind and tongue of the wizard... Maybe there's a reason for that, right? Maybe that reason ain't good, right? Uh, but he doesn't seem to, you know, so he, but he doesn't seem to put any of those things together. Instead of looking in here and being like, whoa, this is the center from which all the queerness comes, right? Instead of saying like, you know, okay, the, the you know, the, 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 the evil power that is at work here, this must be why, you know, I can't think straight and, and she's probably in on it. Neither one of those things seem to cross his mind here, right? She spoke now very softly. Benderesk is lord and inheritor of the Terranon, but he cannot use the thing. He cannot make it wholly serve his will. Nor can I, alone or with him. Neither he nor I has the skill and power. You have both. How do you know that? From the stone itself. I told you that it spoke of your coming. 
It knows its master. It has waited for you to come. Before ever you were born, it waited for you, for the one who could master it. And he who can make the Terranon answer what he asks and do what he wills has power over his own destiny, strength to crush any enemy, mortal or mortal or of the other world, foresight, knowledge, wealth, dominion, and a wizardry at his command that could humble the Archmage himself. As much of that, as little of that as you choose, is yours for the asking. Um... Exactly, David Urbach is saying. Ah, the promise of power and total mastery. What young Ged wanted so much. Power and fame. Absolutely. This temptation would have been right up his street when he was 14. Right? No question. Um, and, you know, even down to his early days at Roke, right? This is the recognition that he wanted. Um but of course, there's more than this, right? With this mastery, with the power of the stone, as the master of the power of the stone, um, he would be able to crush the shadow which is uh, which is following him, right? Um, and then she adds fatally, right, at the end, that it is only darkness that can overcome darkness. Um, but yes, James, this, uh, James Stevens is absolutely is everything uh, that... Uh, Ged wanted when he was a kid. Absolutely. And notice, even the, apart from the whole foresight, knowledge, wealth, dominion, humbling wizardry, right? Even apart from all that, merely it knows its master. It has waited for you to come, right? That is what he wanted to hear his whole childhood, right? You are special. You are not just powerful. Right. You are in a totally different league. Right. You are like. Prophecy level amazing. Right. Your name is destined to go down in history. You are the one that like the world has been waiting for you to be born. Right. That is exactly exactly what he wanted to hear somebody tell him. Remember, that's what he kind of thought he was getting um, when he went with Ogion, you know, right. Like, um. You know, when he sets off with Ogion and he's like, OK, Wizard's Apprentice here. Right. Line up, folks. Uh, autographs for cheap. I mean, that's exactly what he th kind of the path he felt he was going down. And one of the reasons why he was so disappointed uh, by Ogion and Ogion's training. Um, we are told that Ged is very seriously tempted and not just by this temptation, of course, but by what it means, right? That he would have here the power to overcome the shadow, to free himself from this doom. Um, but this is the second time that he has been offered this in a particularly sketchy way, right? First by the dragon of Pendor, and now um, by Seret, uh, in or do you guys say Seret or Seret? First or second syllable? I'm a little split on this myself, uh, and I'm open to it. I didn't do a, a poll, um, but I'd be interested to hear how you guys do it. Stress on the first or second syllable. Um, I was kind of thinking it stress on the first syllable, but when I was reading al aloud, I didn't feel like it always worked for that. Okay, most of you are first syllable, actually. Okay, all right, good. I'll stick with it then. Um... I think I was uh, defaulting to that, too, only because that's the pattern that we've been following almost all the way through. Most of the polysyllabic names we've uttered have been first syllable stress. So I was just kind of following that pattern. But um, um, yeah, Karita, that's a really good observation, too. Her final tag on to the end of that temptation, right? As much of that, as little of that as you choose is yours for the asking, right? That's much more subtle, right? Instead of giving him a temptation, which just makes the blanket assumption, obviously, like, I know you, Sparrowhawk, right? You are all about the bling, right? Your wealth, dominion, knowledge, humbling archmages, right? This is exactly what you want most in the world, right? I've got a stone for you. Instead of sounding like, a, you know, sort of a cheap salesman in that way, right? She, she does this... Um, uh, she makes this other move, right? Um, I'm not assuming you want 
you know, like ridiculous wealth, right? Because, I mean, come on, how shallow, right? Nor am I assuming that the opportunity to have great power that you will misuse flagrantly is totally your bag, right? So uh, obviously, like, you know, you're probably going to use this with extreme discretion and, uh, you know, not like just aggrandize yourself recklessly because, you know, obviously. Uh, so, yeah, you can I, you don't have to use it. But you can use that power as little as you like, but the power will be yours. Um, that is a, a really brilliant touch uh, at the end there. Once more, she lifted her strange bright eyes to him and her gaze pierced him so that he trembled as if with cold. Yet there was fear in her face, as if she sought his help but was too proud to ask it. Ged was bewildered. She had put her hand on his as she spoke. Its touch was light. It looked narrow and fair on his dark, strong hand. He said, pleading, Seret, I have no such power as you think. What I had once, I threw away. I cannot help you. I am no use to you. But I know this. The old powers of earth are not for men to use. They were never given into our hands, and in our hands they work only ruin. Ill means ill end. I was not drawn here, but driven here, and the force that drove me works to my undoing. I cannot help you. Remember when we were looking at his response, his taking his first assignment, right? in low turning before, um, right after his graduation, right? in his staffing. Um, and we were talking about his increased humility, but how the humility seemed to be, it seemed to be at the very best equal parts, humility and self doubt. Right. Um, this is a really interesting step forward. I think we can still see both of those things. We can see humility there, not claiming, extraordinary power, not seizing that thing which would have been the most tempting prize, the most tempting thing uh, to, you know, 12 and 14 year old Dooney. Uh, instead, he, he forswears that or d disclaims worthiness that he fits that, right? Uh, instead of feeling that it might be his destiny. Um, but at the same time, we can see the self-doubt still, too. But this is not just self-doubt in the place of humility. There's a kind of integration of those things, it seems to me, that has, uh, uh, that has happened, that has come to pass here. I have no such power as you think. What I had once, I threw away. Right? So this is not just, I'm doubting myself. This is, I am acknowledging the consequences of my actions. Um, he no longer does. There is a very real way in which he no longer has that power. Remember, just recently, when he confronted the shadow, rather when the shadow turned and confronted him, um, he was completely powerless, right? So there, it's, this is not false modesty. This is not just self-doubt. Uh, that's truth. Um, by binding the shadow to himself, the shadow which has the power to bind him and strip him of his power, right? To bereave him of his power uh, when they are confronted, he has, in a sense, thrown away such power as she thinks, right? As she is suggesting. I cannot help you. I am no use to you. Um, but I know this. The old powers of Earth are not for men to use. Um, yeah. Uh, hang on, I'm forgetting now. Okay, yeah, I think... Okay, I think, I'm trying to remember where I, I... Already forgetting which passages I've included in the slides, which I haven't. Um, Deborah, Deborah, there was that passage um, where we're told explicitly that there is a power, there's a being, a spirit, which is bound within that stone. The stone that is the stone of the Terranon is a prison uh, in which, you know, and he says that there's like multiple levels of binding. It's a really, uh, it's a really tight little prison there, but it can still speak. It can sk still interact with the world um, through the stone. Um, 
so yes, that uh, this is not just a magic rock, right? That magic rock is a prison, uh, and it is a prison which keeps one of the old powers of the earth. They were never given into our hands, and in our hands they work only ruin. Um, yes, there are different kinds of wizardry, right? There's re- re- Remember the, the dude in Oskil that he met, the wizardly guy who recommended that he might want to try the court, of, you know, the who told him that the court of the Tarragon is, uh, is, is really lovely these days, right? Uh, and uh, he should totally go visit. Um, that guy was saying that, oh, you know, the wizards of Roke are, are, they're so parochial, right? They look down on any wizardry other than Roke wizardry. But, you know, there's, there's Oskillian wizardry, which is different, but like just as good. Um, now, of course, Ged is obviously speaking as a disciple of Roke here, um, but he seems correct, right? If you are using power, if you are trying to use the strength of an old power of Earth for your own ends, you will find, he says, that uh, in our hands, the old powers of Earth will only work ruin, and it will only work ruin to us as well. Um, <laughs> Divorce says maybe it's Merlin. Yeah, uh, older than that, probably, but uh, maybe, you know, maybe eventually Merlin will... Uh, uh, will ferment into an old power of earth uh, locked inside a stone. Can't rule it out. Um, yeah, good. Melanie, I absolutely agree with you. It is really impressive. Um, l- that is, Le Guin's ability to make Ged's growth and change seem natural. Um, Melanie points out that it was just on page 40 that Ged was bragging about his skill and power, and she's able to bring him through this big transition in really quite a short time. Um, but it feels so real and natural. I agree. Um, uh, it is, uh, it is as so much of Le Guin is just an, a really remarkable uh, achievement that she does here. Um, notice the the four words with which he like into which he condenses what he has learned, right? What he has taken in through his own experience. Ill means ill end. Right. Um, it, he knows. Right. Ill means ill end. Uh, it matters. Right. Um, your intentions matter. We got that before. But ill means will bring you to an ill end. You can't just use an old power of earth for good and with pure intentions. Um I was not drawn, he- and, and, and now, now notice where he's coming back to with the shadow. Remember in his earlier conclusion, he said, or he concluded, his first theory was that the shadow had been uh, shepherding him here, you know, had been like corralling him here the whole time, right? Um, that his coming here was the work of the shadow. Then he was like, nah, no, I think it's probable, it's more probable that I was being drawn here by some other power, and the shadow was just like, taking advantage. It was just following me, right? So that's how we both ended up here. Um, because this other power, and there is another power, because something is keeping the shadow out, uh, so that's pretty clear, and it seems to be anti-shadow, or else why keep it out, right? Um, now he's met the other power. Now he sees what that other power is, and he knows more about it. And after he's met it, he now says, I was not drawn here, but driven here. And the force that drove me works to my undoing. Now, having met the old power, right, or having now seen what's at work here, now he says, oh, yeah, no, 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 it was the shadow that drove me here, right? This, has, this, this whole thing has shadow written all over it. The force that drove me works to my undoing. I cannot help you. If he does what the shadow wants him to do, he is going to be destroyed, right? So, turns out that um, he was mostly right, or at least partly right. Ged's eyes cleared, and his mind, finally. He looked down at Seret. It is light that defeats the dark, he said, stammering. Light. 
as as he spoke he saw as plainly as if his own words were the light that showed him how indeed he had been drawn here lured here how they had used his fear to lead him on and how they would once they had him have kept him they had saved him from the shadow indeed for they did not want him to be possessed by the shadow until he had become a slave of the stone once his will was captured by the power of the stone, then they would let the shadow into the walls, for a Gebeth was a better slave even than a man. If he had once touched the stone or spoken to it, he would have been utterly lost. Yet, even as the shadow had not quite been able to catch up with him and seize him, so the stone had not been able to use him, not quite. He had almost yielded, but not quite. He had not consented. It is very hard for evil to take hold of the unconsenting soul. It is very hard for evil to take hold of the unconsenting soul. Right there, you go. Now there, there's not a there's a sentence that I not only want to read aloud several times. That's one I want to have like cross stitched on my wall, right, in a frame. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, Arthur. Arthur's asking, has Le Guin talked about the concept of evil as an external force before this? We're getting a lot of this stuff stated explicitly. Well, I think at least, if not for the first time, at least more explicitly than we've heard it before. Um, it is very hard for evil to take hold of the unconsenting soul. The truth of his situation, right... Was he drawn here by some other power, or was he driven here by the stone? And the answer is both. Both. Right? The stone didn't... It wasn't just that he was drawn and the, sto and the shadow happened to come along, right? Which was his, well, not first thought, his second thought, right? His first conclusion. Um, it's not just that. Um, nor is it quite that the stone and the shadow are like in active cahoots. I don't think they were like texting each other, right, and laying the plan between the two of them uh, and orchestrating things intimately. Um, uh, yeah. Um, it's, not, it's not quite like that, but see, it doesn't need to be like that. Both of them are trying to destroy him. Both of them, and he sees himself between the two of them, right? Um, once, uh, let's see, uh, yet even as the shadow had not quite been able to catch up with him and seize him, so the stone had not been able to use him. Not quite. Right? There he was between the both of them. Both of them had a go at him, and both of them are driving him, they're both collapsing in on him, right? Um, if he falls to either, he will fall to both. Were he to be taken over by the shadow, the stone would draw him and enslave him. Were he to be enslaved first, he would then get consumed by the shadow and become a slave Gebeth, right? Um, it, um, this is just, again, I don't think this is an act of conspiracy between two conspiring evil creatures, but rather just a little glimpse into the nature of evil and how it operates and what it means, what evil is, right? And there was he in the middle, barely escaping from both. And the narrator telling us how he had escaped from both, right? Not by chance, and not by design, but both, sort of like before, right? It's not that he's done everything right. It's not just that he's passed all the tests. Um, he had almost yielded, but not quite. He had not consented. That's the story. He had not consented. That's what he has done right, and that's why he has escaped, though very narrowly, um, both of these two evils. It is very hard for evil to take hold of the unconsenting soul. Um, so, David, 
when did the stone decide to entrap Ged? Did it learn of him when it first enchanted Serret through her memory of her visit to Roke? Um, of her visit to Gaunt, uh, you mean. Um, uh, it's possible. It's possible, but... We're not told this. Um... Again, thinking about design and chance, right? Um, I don't think that what has happened here is that so Sarah marries Benderesk. You know, Benderesk takes a young, beautiful wife um, and she becomes a slave to the stone uh, just like he is. And the stone is like, hey, hot young wife of the Lord of the Terranon, do you know anybody who might be a really good recruit? And she's like, there was this kid at Gaunt who was kind of cool, and they were like, ah, the kind of cool kid from Gaunt. I, the Terragon, shall lay my snares for him, and I will seek the world over until I've found him, and then I will bring him here. Like, I don't think that's how it went down. I have a hard time believing that that's how it went down, right? Um, I think there's more design to it than that. And again, is it is is it a coincidence that the wizard that he lays he the stone right that the the, the power within the stone lays its trap for um, happens to be one that is pursued by evil right that like you know is it a coincidence that Ged ends up in this like you know pincer movement of the two evil forces no I don't think that's a coincidence I don't think that it's like you know that it was just like double bonus that. Uh, this dude was like already, you know, the dude that the stone decided to go after, the dude who happened to be a childhood acquaintance of the new lady, um, uh, also happened to be like a couple steps down the road to Gebeth. Like, I don't think that was just a, a lucky bonus uh, on their part. It seems to be. Um, and yes, Mark, you're right that he is a truly, he is truly a great wizard. Um, and the old powers of the earth can, can sense that. Sure, yeah, no, there's that too. But again, um, was it just luck that it hit upon, you know, a super talented young wizard who also happened to be, again, a couple steps down the road to Gabbeth? No, again, I don't think any of that's a coincidence. Um, chance and design, or design that looks like chance, or, you know, uh, uh, or chance which is manipulating design. Um, all of these things work together. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and I do agree, David Attlee, that Ged's circumstances are the things, are the sort of thing that would become rumors among the powerful. Um, yes, it is very likely that when word came to the court of the Terranon of the brilliant young wizard student at Roku who had his face eaten off by a shadow, and better, this young, you know, this teenage wizard who mastered the dragon of Pendor, like, that's pretty good resume too, <clears throat> right? Um, uh, but again, I think there's more to it than that as well. I don't think it's only that. Um, I, I, although I was joking, of course, about the Terranon and, and, uh, and the Shadow texting back and forth to coordinate their movements uh, and choreograph their plan, um, I think that there is a kind of likeness here. Right. Both of them are clearly by the narrator placed into like one bucket here. Right. The evil to which he is not consenting. All right. Let's keep going. Hang on a second. Yeah, this one. OK. So he realizes, of course, that she or, you know, so the her husband tries to kill her when she fails. Right. Um uh, when he finds that she fails to tempt to tempt him, which is like kind of harsh because she did a like super good job. Right. I mean, I, I, I missed who it was who was talking about that earlier on. Um, but um, uh, he she's a really good tempter. Right. She's a really good tempter. Um, so, I mean, totally not her fault that she failed here, I'd say. She changed as they passed through that doorway out of the silvery twilight court of the Terranon. She was not less beautiful in the drear light of the moors, but there was a fierce witch look to her beauty, and Ged knew her at last. 
the daughter of the lord of, Rea of the Realbi, daughter of a sorceress of Oskil, who had mocked him in the green meadows above Ogion's house long ago, and had sent him to read that spell which loosed the shadow. But he spent small thought on this, for he was looking about him now with every sense alert, looking for that enemy, the shadow, which would be waiting for him somewhere outside the magic walls. It might be Gebeth still, cloak clothed in Skior's death, or it might be hidden, oh, what a phrase, clothed in Skior's death, holy cow, or it might be hidden in the gathering darkness, waiting to seize him and merge its shapelessness with his living flesh. He sensed its nearness, yet did not see it. But as he looked, he saw some small dark thing, half buried in snow, a few paces from the gate. He stooped, and then softly picked it up in his two hands. It was the Otak, its fine, short fur all clogged with blood, and its small body light and stiff in his cold hands. Okay. First. Um... Devora says when she was young, Ged thought she was ugly. Um, too white, right? Is the change in her or in him or both her, right? And not just in the, like, you know, she was an awkward looking teenager, but now she's a beautiful woman. Not just in that way. Uh, notice she changes when she goes out the door, right? <clears throat> That whole fairy other world thing that was going on, and he's cry, he, he's just, they've just crossed the boundary, right? He's passed out of the gate, which remember, she couldn't even see. As they were trying to get out, she's like, I don't even know where the gate is. Uh, and he can see it, and she can't, right? So he guides her, and he opens the gate, and they plunge out of the gate and leave the court of the Terranon. And as soon as they do, in the drear light of the Morse, it's not just a lighting issue, right? He sees her differently. She does still look beautiful. But there is a fierce witch look to her beauty, and it's only now that he recognizes her. Why didn't he recognize her before? It's not just like, well, you're all grown up now. I would never have known you. It's not just that, right? Um, again, there was an enchantment on him. The, the, the court of the Terranon is a world which is under a spell, right? It is under the power, under the influence of the Terranon. Um, things were altered there. His mind and perceptions were altered there. Um, now he can see her as she really is beautiful, but he can see the fierce witch look to her. As soon as he sees her as uh, she really is, right? Um, and not just as she was made to appear in the court of the Terranon, he recognizes her immediately. Oh, the daughter of the Lord of the Realbi. Daughter of a sorceress of Oskil. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and exactly, Arthur, here we have this other strange coincidence. Right? Um, that she was the one who led him into darkness the first time. Literally, remember him reading the spell in the darkness? Right. Not knowing that he was seeing that he was reading the spell in the dark. Right. Unaware of the darkness that had closed in around him and the shadow, which Ogion is going to tell us is the just the shadow of the shadow. Right. It's the foreshadowing of the shadow. Um, but it was the first time the shadow was in any sense loosed, even though apparently banished by Ogion right away. Right. With his gleaming staff. Um, it was her mockery. That partially led him down this road and certainly enabled if he had not been driven by his desire to prove himself to her to read that spell because remember that was the spell that he was recalling in his mind that's the same spell that he used when he summoned up the spirits of the dead on Roke Knoll and summoned the shadow or brought in the shadow with him right um, that that was I mean so sh it was like, in one sense, like, literally all her faults, right? Or, again, you could hardly blame her. It was his choice, clearly. But, again, she was the one who pushed him down that path to begin with. So, as Arthur asks, was that, you know, her influence on the earlier part of his career? Um, 
part of the shadow or the stone's long-term plan. Uh, again, I think the answer is both no and yes, right? Is it chance or is it design? It is both together, right? It's not a pre-scripted thing, right? This is not, uh, um, they're not fulfilling some script, right? She wasn't a plant that the Terranon placed uh, in his path, right? It's not that the Terranon has been lurking around and trying to bring him in. It's not that the shadow was here long before it was here, right? Trying to induce Ged to do this. Neither of those things are true. And yet it's also not a coincidence. In fact, I would go even further and, and say, I don't think it's a coincidence that that girl ended up becoming the lady of the court of the Terranon. Um, just as I was suggesting that the evil of the shadow and the evil of the stone kind of coordinate almost as it were automatically because they're both doing the same kind of thing. There's something, I don't know what, uh, in their nature that calls out to each other. You know, it's just, it's, chance and design, right? Both and neither. Um, and I think that the coincidence of his early life and his meeting her again and her being in this position is certainly not a coincidence. I, I don't think it means it was all a conspiracy from day one. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, good. James uh, Stevens points out it's also the time that Ged decided to go to Roke instead of staying with Ogion. Yes, exactly. Um, again, was that so? To say that all of these things are caused by the stone is to give the stone too much power. It doesn't have that kind of power. Not in Roke. Not all the way, you know, on the other side of the sea. Um, but it's also not a coincidence, right? Um, he gets all of this evidence in this chapter that he is part of a bigger story, right? Um, that this is not just about him facing the consequences of a bad choice he made one night on Rope Knoll, right? Um, this is not just about, I went to a party and did a stupid thing and the rest of my life has been ruined ever since, right? It's not about that. Um, or it's not just about that. Um... But of course, we get the other revelation. Just as he sees her and understands who she is, um, he finds the body of the Otak. Just as she is revealed for who she really is, that unreality of him, right? how everything around him was alien, how he had lost everything that he had known, lost everything that made him him. His staff had been burned. His OTAC was lost. Um, well, he's, he's found the OTAC again, right? The, that light, that drear light of the Moors reveals more than just the fierce witch look of the beauty of Seret, Right? it reveals the dead body of the Otak. Um, he's not lost it. It's been killed. What do you think happened to it? I don't know, but I have a theory. Look where it is. Half buried in the snow a few paces from the gate. And it's bloody yes Devora I agree um, Devora says uh, she thinks Seret did it I agree I agree so first of all the last we saw of the Otak it was inside his clothing it is possible of course that it fell out during his fight with the Gebeth and his running away right 
that's one possibility. Um, and that it was then killed by the Gebeth. That's possible. Um, the other possibility is that it remained safely tucked away inside his clothing, even as he fought and then ran. Um, but remember, all of his clothes, the clothing in which the Otak was hiding, were taken away from him. And we don't know what was done with them. Presumably they were destroyed. So the Otak would have been found during his, um, you know, while he was unconscious, while they were changing him. Um, and I think, um, uh, yeah, um, it did attack the Gebeth. Okay, wait, all right. It did, it did, it did attack the Gebeth. You're right. It did attack the Gebeth. We did see it then. So there was another time that we saw it. Um, but I don't think it was separate from him. The reason I think that the reason I blame the servants of the of of the Terragon of the the Terranon for the death of the Otak, um, uh, you know, if I were uh, you know, the assistant district attorney and had to bring a case, uh, you know, people versus the murderer of the Otak, I would finger the people in the court, uh, primarily because of the location of the body. Uh, Terragon, yeah. Um, uh, primarily because of the, the location of the body. Um, I, uh, I, I, I don't... If it had been injured and killed while out... Um, you know, where the fight had happened. I mean, what? It was injured and then, what, like, limped its entire way here and then randomly died a foot outside the gate? I mean, that's possible in a kind of a tragic way, but it seems to be less likely, right? More like, I mean, it, it is in a place, it is in just the place where it would be if someone inside the court had killed it and chucked it out the gate, right? It's right next to the, it's in the snow, half buried in the snow, right outside the gate, as if its dead body was tossed out of the gate. Um, so that's why I tend to believe that it was killed by, um, uh, by, by them in there, that this was, he destroyed the staff, the staff was destroyed in his, when he was fighting the shadow, right? His staff burned in his hands, burned his hand, in fact. Um, which is, of course, again, a, a lovely little metaphor for his own power. He threw away his power, he said. Worse than threw away his power, uh, he misused his power. Uh, and here we have his power, his wizard staff, literally burning his hand, right? Um, but, um, but the Otak, that's more personal. And I mean, I get his power, you could say, is tolerably personal. Sure. But that seems to have more to do with his life, his identity. Again, part of that whole, I am in fairy now. I am under an enchantment and in a completely new world. The loss of the Otak seems much more connected with that. And the very fact that it was trying to defend him against the Gebeth shows it is it is on his side against it is part of remember he does not consent to evil well neither does the otak right the otak does not consent to evil um and i got to i i would think that um you know when he's taken in by these people of questionable motives and you know stripped and dandified and everything else i would think the otak would take exception to that um Yes. And David Erbach, I do agree that it would be poetic justice uh, that she who murdered the Otak at the stone's behest is herself murdered by the stone servants while in animal form. Yeah, that's another thing that kind of makes me like Serret for this crime, actually. Um, and also, as this is like the final emblem, right, of what they generally, the servants of the stone, and she in particular, was trying to do to him. Right? Um, just as she is revealed, the fierce witch look in her is revealed, so the body of his beloved little friend, the Otak, is revealed to him. Right? What 
the the uncaring malice uh, of the, what they are trying to take from him, uh, to take from him his identity, his to, to make of him a slave, uh, and then a Gebeth slave, right? Um, what they were trying to strip from him, their killing of the Otak and just tossing it outside the gate. Um, again, there's a there's there strikes me as a parallel here, right? Just as he looks at her and sees her as he really is, he's also looking at the Otak, the Otak's body, holding it in his hands and seeing, in a sense, himself, right? Um, this is, this is this was this is me, or this would have been me, right? Um, this is what this is what they were trying to do to me. Um, yeah, very sad. Are you messenger or message? Ogion said gently to the hawk, of course, after he arrives in Gaunt. Come on with me. As he spoke, to the, as he spoke the hawk looked at him. Ogion was silent a minute. I named you once, I think, he said, and then strode to his house and entered, bearing the bird still on his wrist. He made the hawk stand on the hearth in the fire's heat and offered it water. It would not drink. Then Ogeon began to lay a spell, very quietly, weaving the web of magic with his hands more than with words. When the spell was whole and woven, he said softly, Ged. Not looking at the falcon on the hearth, he waited some while, then turned and got up and went to the young man who stood trembling and dull-eyed before the fire. He ends up, and I love that question, are you messenger or message? Um, especially in the context of the kinds of questions that his visit to the Terranon has been, uh, has been uh, uh, prompting us to ask, right, about whose plan is this? Like, what destiny is being unfolded again? Who has deemed the doom? Um, um, or the deem has been doomed by whom? Uh, that, for Ogeon to be asking, are you a messenger or are you a message? Um, has someone sent you? Right? Um, he seems to be gently asking a similar question, but of course, in a very, with a very different result. He's not thinking of, you know, the, the dark conspiracy of sketchy witch girls and and evil power stones and uh, face eating shadows. Um, he's thinking of the message. This is a message of hope, right? Um, if he's a message, right? Um, the message has been delivered to the only one who could receive it, right? And the only one who could recover him. Um, and of course, he's both. Both messenger and message. This renaming of Ged is clearly an important moment, right? I named you once, I think, he says. Right. And then he names him again. Um, and there is clearly a kind of rebirth here. Right. I don't want to overdo that, but um, just as we saw in the naming ritual, it was, you know, this sort of like, you know, the wading through the stream, the emergence from this it was a very birth like moment, right? A very birth like ritual. Um, birth and rebirth ritual. Uh, so here he seems to be being being named, being, and there he is, a young man trembling and dull-eyed before the fire, right? Um, he's been healed by Ogion before. He's being healed again. He was named by Ogion before. He's being named again and set down a new path. Um... Ged shares with him his fear that the shadow doesn't have a name. All things have a name, said Ogion, so certainly that Ged dared not repeat that the Archmage Gensher, uh, what the Archmage Gensher had told him, that such evil forces as he had loosed were nameless. The dragon of Pendor, indeed, had offered to tell him the shadow's name, but he put little interest in the truth of that offer. 
nor did he believe Seret's promise that the stone would tell him what he needed to know. So, he is, so far, the Archmage is told in the Shadow doesn't have a name. Both the dragon and the Terranon suggested that it did have a name and that they knew it or could find it out and tell him. Right? But he doesn't believe either one of them. Where They're like super untrustworthy sources and had all kinds of uh, ulterior motives and were almost certainly lying. So, all in all, he's still siding with the Archmage Gensher here. But now here's Ogion stating unequivocally, all things have a name. Who knows better, Ogion or the Archmage Genjer? Well, if it's me, I'm going with Ogion on this one, I gotta say. Um, if the shadow has a name, he said at last, I do not think it will stop and tell it to me. No, said Ogion, nor have you stopped and told it your name, and yet it knew it. On the moors in Oskil, it called you by your name, the name I gave you. It is strange. Strange. Here's Ogion's... Another instance of Ogion's pedagogy, right? Now, Ogion is talking quite a lot here. I mean, this is a, a significant number of words for Ogion, right? Um, and yet he's still not... Um, He's still not speaking directly to the point, right? But do you notice what he's suggesting to Ged? It, the Archmage told him that there was a connection between the two of them, right? The two of you are bound together by your summoning of it. Ogion is pointing out it knew your name, though you hadn't told it. There's a connection between the two of you. It somehow called you by your name, the name I gave you. And he emphasizes that that's really strange. How could the shadow possibly know his name? And you see what he's not telling Ged, right? what he's only suggesting to Ged, the direction that he's pointing Ged towards, right? You can seek its name. You can find its name. If it somehow knew your name, then maybe you can find what its name is. All things have a name. But I am powerless before it. Is there any place... His voice died away before he had asked the question. There is no safe place, Ogion said gently. Do not transform yourself again, Get. The shadow seeks to destroy your true being. It nearly did so, driving you into Hawk's being. No. Where you should go, I do not know. Yet I have an idea of what you should do. It is a hard thing to say to you. Ged's silence demanded truth, and Ogion said at last... You must turn around. Turn around? If you go ahead, if you keep running, wherever you run you will meet danger and evil, for it drives you. It chooses the way you go. You must choose. You must seek what seeks you. You must hunt the hunter. He has already seen, he has already discovered for himself, right, that when he is trying to escape the shadow, it's not only that he can't escape the shadow, it's not only that he has failed to escape it, it's been far worse than that, right? He has found that the shadow is bringing him exactly into the danger and evil that he, you know, into other dangers and evils. Um, when he runs away from evil, he ends up running towards evil, as he certainly found in the court of the Terranon. Um, and I am minded of that sea voyage that he had to take to get to Oskil. Remember the one where he ended up rowing as a, an oarsman, right? Like a galley slave. You know, he sort of sold himself as, an, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a rower for the ship. Um, 
there was a way in which he, you know, remember he was trying to make his way as a wizard to do what he does and be who he is in order to make his way and found that the only way that he could go, the way that he was trying to go in order to escape from the shadow was this way which sort of denied himself and put him in, you know, and of course introduced him to Skior who ended up becoming the Gebeth, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, we can see lots of different ways, lots of different consequences of his attempt to flee the shadow and how he, in doing so, has been giving power, giving the shadow power over himself. Um, yeah, Gerald is asking, uh, Gerald is asking, does this mean, sorry, Gerald, I, I pronounced your name with a hard G because like, I, that's, that's where I am right in this book. Uh, so Geralt, can I call you Geralt in this class? Uh, said, does this mean that, uh, uh, for the balance, only one of the two can be the hunter? Um, possibly, possibly. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily a balance thing, but in trying to preserve himself, even in trying to preserve others, right? I mean, he left low turning because he was afraid the shadow was going to come there and you know, destroy others, right? He was trying to flee from everybody that he knew or everybody who might be harmed. Um, so part of his desire to run was altruistic in that sense. But, um, uh, but yeah, how does it fit with balance? It is clear that in the question of in trying to escape it, he failed to escape it. In trying to remain free of it, he was making himself its slave. Right? That is the true, is the re, sort of the, the reality, the truth that Ogion is teaching him here. And he finally again shows some of that uh, growth that we were talking about earlier in the class. Um, and listens to Ogion. Right. Master, I go hunting. I love that. As he's hunting, we're told in chapter eight now, on the sea he wished to meet it. If meet it, he must. He was not sure why this was, yet he had a terror of meeting the thing again on dry land. Out of the sea there rise storms and monsters, but no evil powers. Evil is of earth. And there is no sea no running of river or spring in the dark land where once Ged had gone. Death is the dry place. Though the sea itself was a danger to him in the hard weather of the season, that danger and change and instability seemed to him a defense and chance. And when he met the shadow in this final end of his folly, he thought, maybe at least he could grip the thing, even as it gripped him, and drag it with the weight of his body and the weight of his own death down into the darkness of the deep sea, from which... So held, it might not rise again. So at least his death would put an end to the evil he had loosed by living. Okay, so first of all, the... Uh... Oh, awesome. Noam was uh, thinking back to what we were talking about, about his turning around as uh, in Ogion's advice. Uh, only in the hunted, the hunter. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, good. Um... Yeah, there's no bringing it back to the balance again. Um, yes, Karita, I was noticing that too. You know, Karita's pointing out how, according to that sentence, monsters do not equal evil. Out of the sea there rise storms and monsters, but no evil powers. So yeah, monsters, monsters aren't evil. There are, like, monsters in the sea, right? Um, but they're not evil powers. Evil is of Earth, which is, by the way, a piece of metaphysics that I found quite startling. Evil is of Earth, really. Right. But remember the world that we're in. Right. Earthsea is a world which is mostly water. Earth is the exception in Earthsea. Right. The whole all of the lands that are described here is it's all this is all islands, right? One group of islands or the other. Um, uh, their world 
is pri- like the, the water, the sea, is the primary reality of their world. Death is the dry place. Water is, uh, is of the land of the living. That's, again, I was just really interested by that. Notice what's different in his resolution here. His resolution to die. Again, he was, it's not totally unlike his previous flight, right? He was running in fear before, and now he is seeking to destroy it through courage. So there's obviously a difference there. But there was also self-sacrifice in his desire before, too. He wanted to draw the shadow away from anyone that it could hurt. Um, uh, So, again, that was... um, um, That was... um, that was seemed a good impulse, right? And a similar impulse to this, but this is different, right? Um, just as we have that similarity, we also have profound difference, right? I am going to stand. I am going to, I'm not going to run from it. I'm going to seek it, right? But I'm going to I'm going to draw it to myself, right? I'm going to grab it and I'm going to hold on to it. And the two of us will go down together. Um, he, what he doesn't have is hope, right? He thinks he's going to die. He's not fleeing from that now. He's ready to embrace death, hoping to accomplish good by his death. Um, but he still doesn't have hope. Not for himself, anyway. Um, Noam, that's a really good question. Noam is reminding us of Roque Noel and how, remember, magic done on Roque Noel is more powerful because Roque Noel has its roots all the way down into the earth. Well, Noam, I guess what I would say, it, what I would point out is that it says evil is of earth, which is not the same thing as saying earth is evil. Right. So I don't think that we need necessarily think that Roque Knoll is therefore seriously dodgy and therefore all of Roque kind of questionable. Right. Because it's a super earthy place because of its deep, deep roots from Roque Knoll. Um, I don't think I don't think that's true, because, again, the converse isn't necessarily true. It doesn't mean that all Earth is evil. It just means that evil comes from the earth. It doesn't come from the sea. Uh, so what evil there is comes from the earth, but that doesn't mean everything that's of the earth is evil. Um, is the, the one thing I would throw out there. But David, I, 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 David Attlee, I agree. I think that's a really important distinction. Ged's previous flight was in despair. Now he's resolute. Yes, he still doesn't have hope for himself. Um, but there is a determination to... Not just try to spare others, but to try to save, to embrace his own end in order to, to, to save others. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Nothing was ahead when he looked around. He stood up, chilled, weary of this gazing and peering into the empty murk. Come then, he muttered. Come on, what do you wait for, Shadow? Hang on, pause for a second. One thing I wanted to, I'd wanted to mention... As I was just reminded, as I started reading this passage, I was just reminded. Remember when I said, uh, on the one hand, like him, the shadow determining his course when he was fleeing from it. One of the ways in which I was arguing that we can see some evidence of this is how he's kind of taken out of himself and um, uh, sort of removed from his like wizardly identity by being taken on uh, as an oarsman uh, on the ship to Oskil. His sailing ship here is like the exact opposite of that, right? His awesome little wizard schooner that he makes, right? Where how he takes this crappy leaky boat, right? And he casts all these binding spells on it. And the staff, his wizard staff is the mast of the ship, right? And the sail is a, is a, is a, is a, is, is a wizard sail and the mage wind pushes him around, right? And he's like doing all this like funky maneuvering with his little magic boat. Um, this is like the opposite of that. Uh, And of course, again, we see the difference, right? How he was throwing himself on, he was taking any opportunity, right? He just needed to get into a boat, no matter how he did it, right? 
but he wasn't going under his own steam, right? He was absolutely at the mercy of this really ruthless uh, Osgillian captain uh, who, knowing he was a wizard of Roke, still just took him on as an oarsman, uh, which is kind of shady, right? Um, I mean, a, a shady way to treat a wizard, that is. Um, but again, he was willing to put himself like at the mercy of anything in order to get away, right? Now he is driving the boat, right? This is the boat of his own majory. Uh, and uh, that seems to be a pretty important contrast here between how he's getting about now and how he was getting about before. Um, so nothing was ahead when he looked around. He stood up, chilled, weary of this gazing and peering into the empty murk. Come then, he muttered. Come on. What do you wait for, Shadow? There was no answer, no darker motion among the dark mists and waves. Yet he knew more and more surely now that the thing was not far off, seeking blindly down his cold trail. And all at once he shouted out aloud, I am here, I, Ged the Sparrowhawk, and I summon my Shadow. The boat creaked, the waves lisped, and the wind hissed a little on the white sail. The moments went by. Still Ged waited, one hand on the yew-wood mast of his boat, staring into the icy drizzle that slowly drove in ragged lines across the sea from the north. The moments went by. Then, far off in the rain over the water, he saw the shadow coming. It had done with the body of the Osgillian oarsman Skior, and not as Gebeth did it follow him through the winds and over sea. Nor did it wear that beast shape in which he had seen it on Roke Knoll and in his dreams. Yet it had a shape now, even in the daylight. In its pursuit of Ged, and in its struggle with him on the moors, it had drawn power from him, sucking it into itself. And it may be that his summoning of it, allowed in, in the light of day, had given to it or forced upon it some form and semblance. Certainly it had now some likeness to a man, though being shadow it cast no shadow. So it came over the sea, out of the jaws of Enlad towards Gaunt, a dim, ill-made thing pacing uneasy on the waves, peering down the wind as it came, and the cold rain blew through it. And the cold rain blew through it. Does this woman know how to end a paragraph or what? Holy cow. Seriously. Um... Yeah. 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 Any writer who wants to get better at ending paragraphs, have them read some Ursula Le Guin for crying out loud. Um, so, Gerald, it's interesting. His using his true name. Uh, this, again, of course, is a turning. Right. Instead of him turning to the shadow and having it say his name and bind him by his name, he turns and says his own, reveals his own true name, right? Identifying himself. I get the Sparrowhawk. But you notice the other thing that happened here? The really significant thing that happened here? What else is really significant about what he says when he summons it there? Kimber, you're noticing it too. Yeah, yeah, and David and Arthur and Melanie... I summon my shadow, he says. Yeah, exactly, Noam. He takes ownership over it, right? Now, it's certainly his shadow in the sense that it's peculiarly tied to him, right? This is not in, this, this shadow isn't anybody else's business. This shadow is his business, right? Um, but, of course, anybody who starts talking about my shadow, um, this conjures up entirely other images, right? Um, it is connected with him, right? Having turned around, having become the hunter, having summoned it and named himself openly, revealing his own name, which again, of course, it already knows, but um, but by naming himself like this, and is he beginning to perceive its name, its true nature? Is this a step forward in insight? as to what it is, how it works, and what it's doing? I kind of think it is. And now it's forced into some form and semblance. 
It's not the Gebeth, which was pursuing him. It's not the beast shape that he first saw when it burst out and that he's been having nightmares about. Now it's coming to him, like having identified it as my shadow. Um, he, um, it now takes the form that is at least in some likeness to a man. And the cold rain blew through it. Because it was half blinded by the day and because he had called it, Ged saw it before it saw him. He knew it as it knew him among all beings, all shadows. In the terrible solitude of the winter sea, Ged stood and saw the thing he feared. The wind seemed to blow it farther from the boat, and the waves ran under it, bewildering his eye, and ever and again it seemed closer to him. He could not tell if it moved or not. It had seen him now. Though there was nothing in his mind but horror and fear of its touch, the cold black pain that drained his life away, yet he waited, unmoving. Then all at once, speaking aloud, he called the mage wind strong and sudden into his white sail, and his boat leapt across the gray waves, straight at the lowering thing that hung upon the wind. In utter silence, the shadow, wavering, turned and fled. Yeah, David Erbach, I agree. This is an amazing passage. I almost have nothing even to add to this passage. It's so awesome. Um, we talk about growth, right? The growth of Ged's character. The turning was super important, right? When he took Ogeon's advice and he set out hunting it. But this is where that has gotten real, right? That has led up to this moment. This is the moment. Is he going to actually be the hunter, right? Is he going to follow through? on seeking out this thing. And just as before he was experiencing temptation, right, the temptation of desire, of the power and mastery and freedom from the fear and everything else that he was offered first by the dragon, which was mediocrely tempting, secondly by uh, Seret, which was much more tempting. Um, now he has to face that. He has to confront it without any special resources that were being promised him by all of these dark powers, right? Though there was nothing in his mind but horror and fear of its touch, the cold black pain that drained his life away, yet he waited, unmoving. Okay. He's hunted it. He has found it. Is he going to follow through? Is he going to be able to follow through, right? Then he calls the mage wind strong and sudden and his boat leapt across the gray wave straight at the lowering thing. The second confrontation happens when he... The first confrontation happened when the shadow turned to him, right? Having lured him out where he wanted to get him, that is, out into the middle of nowhere, but not quite nowhere, right? Out away from civilization, but quite close to the Tower of the Terranon, right? Um, that's where the shadow brought him and then turned about and confronted him. Now this second confrontation is all about Ged's initiative, first in seeking it, but then finally in continuing. Um... Yes, Noam, there is a dual meaning in wavering there. It's wavering both visibly, right? The shadow is kind of visible and kind of not visible. It's, it's almost winking out of sight there. But of course, it is wavering in its resolution, right? It has come, it is seeking him. It can't see him. It's daytime and it's having a hard time seeing him. It's just vaguely seeking back down the path where it thinks he's gone. Um, so it's seeking him, but it wavers when he charges towards it. So then we have the high speed chase. And then all at once he saw the shadow for a moment, not far from him, 
The world's wind had been sinking, and the driving sleet of the storm had given way to a chill, ragged, thickening mist. Through this mist he glimpsed the shadow, fleeing somewhat to the right of his course. He spoke to the wind and sail, and turned the tiller and pursued, though again it was a blind pursuit. The fog thickened fast, boiling and tattering where it met with the spell wind, closing down all round the boat, a fearless pallor that deadened light and sight. Even as Ged spoke the first word of a clearing charm, he saw the shadow again, still to the right of his course, but very near, and going slowly. The fog blew through the faceless vagueness of its head, yet it was shaped like a man, only deformed and changing like a man's shadow. Ged veered the boat once more, thinking he had run his enemy to ground. In that instant it vanished, and it was his boat that ran aground, smashing up on shoal rocks that the blowing mist had hidden from his sight. He was pitched nearly out, but grabbed hold of the mast staff before the next breaker struck. This was a great wave, which threw the little boat up out of the water and brought her down on a rock, as a man might lift up and crush a snail's shell. Yes, Mark, exactly. Fog again, just like Ged's, or Dooney at the time, uh, just like his uh, defense against the Kargish warriors at the very beginning. Ged will realize this. Ged himself will recognize this parallel after he wakes up, right, on the beach where he washes up after his little shipwreck here. After his little, the ship of his majory is, uh, is, is destroyed here. Yeah, good. D Devorah was just uh, noticing this too. Yes. Um, he too is lured to his own near destruction, just as he lured the Kargish warriors to charge off the cliff, right, and then to run away from shadows that they perceived in the fog. Um, so the shadow itself has played that trick on him, his own trick back to him. Um, so, this second confrontation. So there are a couple of conclusions from that, right? One is the parallel. The parallel between the power that the, sha that the shadow has over him and his own power that he used before, right? His first big deed, his first famous thing. Um, but also, the other thing that I would point out here is, uh, let's step back for a second and rate Ged's performance in the second confrontation, right? If his performance in the first confrontation was C-, minus, right? I mean, he survived beating, you know, attacking it with his staff was good, though, again, it burned his hands. So, like, you know, it didn't seem awesome necessarily. And his running away was better. Um, but still, like, he did not do well in that first confrontation. Right. Um, he almost was destroyed. He escaped, but barely escaped. So not high marks for that. Right. Um, then um, he... In this one, it looks like he's getting straight A's at the beginning, right? I mean, that initial confrontation and him feeling the horror and uh, and and fear and desire to run, and but then charging off towards him, that was awesome, right? And yet, I don't think he gets full marks here, right? He's tricked. He is lured by the shadow. In other words, it seems to me, just as he proved through his own experience as Ogion pointed out to him, that running away wasn't going to work, right? I think here he has also learned that charging is not going to work, right? This is way better. He's doing this second confrontation goes way better than the first confrontation, right? He has chosen the ground. He has caused the shadow to flee from him. He is now officially the hunter and it the hunted. And yet, and yet, um, he is almost destroyed, right? His pursuit almost leads to his death. Um, it is a reflection of his hot-headedness, Christopher, I agree. Um, and yeah, Gerald, I, 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 at the end of the day, see, since he almost drowns, you have to kind of say this, this has got to be kind of close to a fail. I still think it's a little harsh, Right? I, he did mostly well, but again, so for, forget about grading. He has learned something else, right? He learned something from the first one. He, he and we learned something from this second one, I think. And I think that that message has to be 
this isn't the way. Charging after it isn't the way. He can't... To be the hunter, to hunt the shadow, means something else other than that. It doesn't mean... getting out in your magic boat and charging at the shadow, trying to run it down or catch it, right? Um, and you're right, Noam, in the end, he doesn't choose the ground, right? Not the, not the final ground. Um, he did confront it during the daytime and at sea. That's what I meant when, he, when I said he chose the ground, right? Their initial confrontation happened where and how Ged had been planning, right? And that was good. Um, but yes, you're right, Noam. He ends up not in the same kind of predicament that he was when he was running away, but in an equally potentially destructive one. Well, I know I won't even say that. An honest drowning is much better than what almost happened to him in the court of the Terranon, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so I would say that even the if you take into account the particular kind of disaster that almost came to him here, this is still a lesser disaster. Um, he still would have drowned an honest man, right, uh, and his own master. Uh, he'd, he'd have drowned on his own terms had he been killed here. Um, this is still a better fate than was awaiting him at the court of the Terranon where he was being brought by the shadow. Um, or, and he's also going to be no Gebeth either, right, if he, uh, if he drowns here. Um, but still, clearly, this is not the way either. So why not? Why not? He's th in pursuing it, he seems to be doing exactly what Ogeon said, right? Um, exactly. A fool, but an honest fool, he remains, Christopher. That's it. That's it. Um, oops, sorry. I just went backwards. It was a rocky sandbar, a mile wide at its widest and a little longer than that, fringed all about with shoals and rocks. No tree or bush grew on it, no plant but the bowing seagrass. The hut stood in a hollow of the dunes, and the old man and woman lived there alone in the utter desolation of the empty sea. The hut was built, or piled up rather, of driftwood planks and branches. Their water came from a little brackish well beside the hut, their food was fish and shellfish, fresh or dried, and rockweed. The tattered hides in the hut, and a little store of bone needles and fish hooks, and the sinew for fish lines and fire drill, came not from goats as Ged had thought at first, but from spotted seal. And indeed, this was the kind of place where the seal will go to raise their pups in summer. But no one else comes to such a place. The old ones feared Ged, not because they thought him a spirit, and not because he was a wizard, but only because he was a man. They had forgotten that there were other people in the world. I dare you to find a closing, a sentence at the end of a paragraph in this book, which is not really good. Um, I agree, Nancy. These two people are very unsettling and also very sad, David Erbach, as you say. Um, and Nancy, it is interesting to contrast these two old people with Ogion, right? We get these two different images of reclusive people who have very little contact with human society and very little interest in human society. Um, but it's, a, it's an important contrast, right? I subtitled this slide A Vision of the Future because this seemed that seemed to me the overall force of this. When he... So... This is how I saw it big picture, right? His first attempt was to run away from the shadow, to escape it. Where did that get him? The court of the Terranon, right? Nearly almost enslaved to an evil ancient power of the world, which would have made of him a horror that would have brought destruction on many, right? Um, that's bad. That's where, so in a sense, then I think we can see, and Ogion was suggesting that this was the case. It seems safe to say that is the natural, like that is a glimpse of the kind of end that that path will take him towards. If he follows that path, the path of, of fleeing, 
trying to escape. That's where he's the kind of place he's going to end up. This, therefore, it seems to me, this seems to be, this is the end that the path of pursuit takes him. Going out and trying to chase the shadow down. He tries to run from the shadow and he ends up in the court of the Terranon. He tries to to chase and catch the shadow and he ends up on this utterly desolate sandbar with these, which would be bad enough if it were just a little desert island. But it's not a little, it's worse than a little desert island, right? It's a desert island in which there are these two people who are have like gone completely feral, right? These two people who have forgotten that there are other people in the world. Um, is this the isolation is the isolation that he is headed towards, right? Um, is is that is are we to understand that if he continues in this, which is a better path, right? This is more constructive than this is this is much less bad than his first choice of path. Right. But we saw that this was not he's still not quite getting it right. Right. It's better, but it's still not right. Um, is this giving us a kind of glimpse into what the flavor of not rightness, if you see what I mean? Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Melanie, the word desolation jumped out at me, too. Um, the old man and woman lived there alone in the utter desolation of the empty sea, just like the desolation that the windows of the, the, the tower looked out upon. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I don't know. I don't want to be too literal about it. I mean, I'm not saying that I think if he continues chasing the shadow in the way that he's doing right now, he's going to end up living in a little hut on a desert island. Um, I just mean, I'm just thinking about how these two people are outside the boundaries of humanity, right? Um, he has twice turned away from people, from civilization, right? Um, and he, you know, wants to flee and wants to pursue. And neither one worked out super well, right? Um, yeah, David Atley is wondering whether, like, whether we're supposed to be pitying these people exactly. Um, on the one hand, it seems that they're very pitiable, but on the other hand, he says they, they, they seem to be not suffering exactly because this is their whole world, right? This is the the whole world to them. Um, yeah, I agree. They are a, they are a strange and interesting case in a lot of ways. But let's keep going. Take three, Ged. Now this sea quest of Ged's was a strange matter. For as he well knew, he was a hunter who knew neither what the thing was that he hunted, nor where in all earth sea it might be. He must hunt it by guess, by hunch, by luck, even as it had hunted him. Each was blind to the other's being. Ged is baffled by impalpable shadows, as the shadow was baffled by daylight and by solid things. One certainty only Ged had, that he in was indeed the hunter now and not the hunted. For the shadow, having tricked him onto the rocks, might have had him at its mercy all the while he lay half dead on the shore and blundered in darkness in the stormy dunes. But it had not waited for that chance. It had tricked him and fled away at once, not daring now to face him. In this he saw that Ogion had been right. The shadow could not draw on his power so long as he was turned against it. So he must keep against it keep after it, though its track was cold across these wide seas, and he had nothing at all to guide him but the luck of the world's wind blowing southward, and a dim guess or notion in his mind that south or east was the right way to follow. <laughs> Fourth the one hunter, uh, says Arthur. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, oh, good. Melanie, that's really good. Melanie says that the two people on the island seem also to represent the hopelessness that I was talking about before. They can't or won't escape their circumstances. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure it's exactly the same thing as the kind of hopelessness that Ged had at that point, but I, I that I think is really interesting. There is a kind of there is a way in which they're a kind of uh, well, a, a sort of a, a, a species of despair, right? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, Melanie's thinking maybe reflection, like that they, they reflect the hopelessness better than represent. Yeah, yeah, I, I can, I definitely see that. I think that's a really interesting way to think about it. So what's the difference? What's the difference between Shadow Quest part, Take 3 and, you know, version 2? What's different now about this new hunt? What do you notice about it? No more summoning. Yes. Yes. Um, that kind of headlong recklessness with which he was moving towards it, right? He knew it was coming towards him and he went charging towards it. And then when it turns and runs, he goes careening after it, right? He summons it to himself. Now what's he doing? Yes, no, I'm exactly. He's using the whirlwind instead of the mage wind. Yeah, exactly. He's not driving himself towards the shadow and summoning it to himself. Again, there's not that... Both of those things, right? The mage wind at his back and the summoning that he's got is like, you know, a collision, like he's playing chicken with the shadow, right? That's not what's happening now. He is still pursuing it. He still is hunting it, right? But he's using the whirlwind. And it is more tracking than pursuit, James, but it's not even exactly tracking it because he says, you know, he's got a uh, he's got to keep after it, though its track was cold across the wide sea. So the idea of following a cold track does put him in that kind of a hunting mode, right? And yet, like a, more like a stalking mode than a than a pursuit mode, right? This is not a high speed chase anymore. Uh, this is now a uh, this is now he's now tracking. He's now he's now stalking. I agree. Um, but what does he have to guide him? Luck. Luck. Each was blind to the other's being. He must hunt it by guess, by hunch, by luck, even as it had hunted him. Right? Um, yeah, he has to give in to it. Yes, Christopher, it's almost as though he's putting his faith in the power of life to put him where he needs to be when the time is right. There is a kind of faith here. There is a kind of hope here, right? A kind of trust. And more importantly, I think, there is a kind of equilibrium here. He doesn't have to summon it. He doesn't have to charge towards it. He's going to meet it. The two of them are going to be drawn together because of like, because there's equilibrium there, right? We can see the balance between it and him, right? He must hunt it by guess, by hunch, by luck, even as it had hunted him. When it was pursuing him, it wasn't making a plan, didn't need to make a plan, right? Um, he doesn't need to make a plan either. And this is a very different attitude. I don't want to say that he's now, he now feels hope, right? Or has like new grounds for hope or something like that. It's not, it doesn't seem exactly the same as that. And yet, he is no longer going seeking death as he was before. He's still ready for death. Um, but he's also not going by his own confidence, right? Again, it's not his own mage wind pushing him ahead. He's just going where the whirlwind blows him. Trusting that 
the two of them are going to meet. And he has a dim guess or notion in his mind that the south, that south or east was the right way to follow. When he stops trying, he finds that he knows the right way to go. And so he follows that hunch, that guess. So in its form, I am setting out by boat to hunt and chase down the shadow. It seems like the same kind of thing as his second voyage, right? His second trip. Um, but it's quite different in its quality and in its nature. And simultaneous with that is this realization. He is officially the hunter and not the hunted. He is not in danger from it anymore. It's not going to jump him. It's not pursuing him. It's not just that he has to, um, you know, it's still going to try to sneak up on him and he has to be on his guard. He doesn't need to be on his guard, right? He is no longer living in fear. He knows that the hunting is for him. Um, that's now his role. And so that's what I'm like, that realization is what I'm tempted to characterize as a new hope for him. Um, more hope than he had before, but I think it's, that's not exactly it. It's more a new understanding, a new realization of the situation, right? All of these things are get understanding what's happening more and more, a new knowledge, just as, you know, wizardry is about understanding the true nature of things, right? And what he's doing is understanding the true nature of the shadow. It only had power over him because he feared it. It only could lure him off into the wilderness and pounce on him as a gebeth because he was trying to flee it. Now that he is hunting it, it has no power to do that anymore. He understands better how it is just as his last insight, the insight that kind of marked the second hunt, the second journey, right, and separated it from the first was that recognition, my shadow. I call my shadow. Now, this new recognition, I am the hunter. It can't hunt me. So the third confrontation. He turned the boat around, working her carefully round with spell and makeshift oar, lest she knock up against the underwater rocks or be entangled in the outreaching roots and branches, till she faced outward again, and he was about to raise up a wind to take him back as he had come, when suddenly the words of the spell froze on his lips and his heart went cold within him. He looked back over his shoulder. The shadow stood behind him in the boat. He ha had he lost one instant, he had been lost but he was ready, and lunged to seize and hold the thing, which wavered and trembled there within arm's reach. No wizardry would serve him now, but only his own flesh, his life itself, against the unliving. He spoke no word, but attacked, and the boat plunged and pitched from his sudden turn and lunge, and a pain ran up his arms into his breast, taking away his breath, and an icy cold filled him, and he was blinded, yet in his hands that seized the shadow there was nothing, darkness air. He stumbled forward, catching the mast to stay his fall, and light came shooting back into his eyes. He saw the shadow shudder away from him and shrink together, and then stretch hugely up over him, over the sail, for an instant. Then, like black smoke on the wind, it recoiled and fled, formless, down the water, towards the bright gate between the cliffs. What did he do when the shadow appeared on Roque Knoll? You remember? What was his response? When the shadow burst out and reared up and pounced towards him. Remember what he did? As I recall, if I'm wrong, you can correct me. Uh, I haven't read this book that many times, so sometimes I misremember, like I'd forgotten about the attack of the Otak on the on the Gebeth. Um, exactly. 
David Erbach, that's my memory too. He screamed and fell down, clutching his face. Like he, he sees the shadow which pounces on him, and he he ducks away and curls up like like you do when a beast is lunging and trying to eat your face, right? Had he lost an instant, he had been he had been lost, but he was ready. Ready for what? Had so I my understanding of this is. What, lost an instant? What does that mean? I think, had he done that again, had he turned and flinched back, had he responded in fear, as would have been totally natural, he would have been lost. It would have attacked him again and consumed him, presumably. But he doesn't do that. The instant he seizes it, he lunges at it, right? He seizes it and holds it. What's different about this confrontation and the second confrontation? What's different? In the first confrontation, he was just desperately trying to defend himself. Right. First with magic, which he couldn't do because his name was named. Right. Then with his staff and then running away to try to save his life. Right. Um, in the second time, he calls it to himself and then chases after it. Right. Seeking to pursue it. And remember, what's his goal? His goal is to destroy himself and take it with him, right? His hope is that, again, what I was characterizing as hopelessness, as despair before, he believes the shadow is going to destroy him when they confront each other, but the difference is he's seeking it out, hoping that he can, through his death, accomplish something, right? But he has no hope for his own life, for his survival, or for his defeating of it. And yet... He's going after it, right? Um, what he does now, he seizes it. What doesn't he do when he seizes it? Throw himself overboard, right? Why? Why would that not have been a good plan? Why was plan B a bad plan in the end? I mean, the actual plan of like his anti-shadow plan. Plan A was escape it, elude it, right? That was a disaster. Plan B was bring myself to a place, like seek it out so that I can find it and when I find it, I'll drown myself in the water, which is a totally non-deathy thing. You know, this water is about life and death is the dry place. So if the shadow drowns with me, then it'll be good and it'll be trapped. Right? But he was going to grab it. Right? He was gonna, that was the plan. The plan was to grab it and to die. And now he grabs it again. So is this still plan B? I think there's a major difference. And here's where I see the major difference. No wizardry would serve him now, but only his own flesh, his life itself against the unliving. Only in the darkness the light only in darkness the light, right? Um, only in death, life. His own flesh, his life itself, is against the unliving. What was he trying to fight it with before? Exactly, Melanie. Exactly. Just what I was thinking. 
before he was trying to fight this unliving thing with death. Right? I will die. And dying, I will take it with me. Right? I will hold it to myself while I die, and then maybe that will kill it. But that was trying to fight darkness with the darkness. Only the light can stand against the darkness, as he said to Sarat, as he broke the spell, right? Only life can oppose unlife, right? And he does. So this, so he grabs it. So it seems like a modified plan B, right? But this is clearly plan C. He grabs it and the boat is rocking all over the place, right? I mean, it wouldn't have taken much for him to be, whoo, overboard we go and down to the depths of the water, which is totally not deathy, except it's killing me. Um, that's not what he does. Instead, he also grabs the staff, right? The staff, which was also the thing that kept him alive, the thing that kept him afloat in the water after his shipwreck, when Plan B shipwrecked, right? It was his staff, the mast, which uh, uh, which kept him alive and kept him afloat. And so that thing, which was his link to life, which kept him alive, right, is what he clings to here in this confrontation. So he's holding the shadow and he's holding the mast, right? Um, but just holding, he can't hold it. Right? There's nothing in his hands. But he is holding it. He is touching it. He can feel it. A pain ran up his arms into his breast, taking away his breath, and an icy cold filled him, and he was blinded. And there's nothing in his hands. So it's not working? Yeah, it is. He saw the shadow shudder away from him and shrink together then stretch hugely up over him, over the sail for an instant. Then like black smoke on the wind, it recoiled and fled formless down the water towards the bright gate between the cliffs. He now pits life against death. First, his own living flesh. Then his staff, right? That link to life and his power. Um... Yeah. Um, yeah. That's plan C. Kind of spontaneous plan C, as it turns out, right? But this is that's a that's very very different, and I think really really importantly different. Okay. Um, all right. This was my very last slide, so I might as well finish it. All terror was gone. All joy was gone. It was a chase no longer. He was neither hunted nor hunter now. For the third time they had met and touched, he had of his own will turned to the shadow, seeking to hold it with living hands. He had not held it, but he had forged between them a bond, a link that had no breaking point. There was no need to hunt the thing down, to track it, nor would its flight avail it. Neither could escape. When they had come to the time and place for their last meeting, they would meet. But until that time, and elsewhere than that place, there would never be any rest or peace for Ged, day or night, on earth or sea. He knew now, and the knowledge was hard, that his task had never been to undo what he had done, but to finish what he had begun. He's not trying to undo it. He's trying to do, to finish what he started. Plan D now, right? Now it's time for the fourth journey, which isn't a quest anymore, which isn't a hunt. It's not a flight. It's not a hunt. It's not a stalking. It's not a tracking. Now it's just a journey to the destination. He doesn't know where the destination is, right? Look at how we saw that, that faith growing, right? The hunches and guesses and luck, right? Look how that has crystallized now. Now he knows there is a doom, right? There is a destiny. Um, he is both message and messenger, right? He's got to see it through, sir. I agree, James. I agree. Um, 
next time we'll talk about the last two chapters, chapter nine and 10 next week. Um, and I want to be thinking in particular about that last sentence. His task had never been to undo what he had done, but to finish what he had begun. What does that mean exactly? I don't think we know yet. At the end of chapter eight, I don't think we know what that means. Um, but hope we'll find out and we'll talk about that next time. Thanks, everybody. No, we've uh, been a little uh, we've uh, gone a little long here again and we'll probably go a little long next week. Um, but uh, uh, but we were we will definitely finish it up next week. Thank you, everybody. Uh, awesome discussion tonight. And I really look forward to concluding our discussion of the book next week. Same time. Thanks, everybody. Good night now. The Mythgard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org fund.